a very warm welcome to everyone joining in for the medical humanities colloquium this is the fifth talk in the series and as you know i mean so far we've had discussions about medical humanities and literature theater this time we have a new medium of discussion photography and i'm so glad to have michaela here who's going to talk about photography today adding a different aesthetic medium to the discussion we have been having about narrative medicine about what uh, medical culture can broadly contribute to the discussion of medicine which is of course a, a, a slightly different and technical kind of a discipline what is the larger role of humanities and social science disciplines in relation to the practice of medicine and especially when we consider things like clinical communication things like medical ethics there are very interesting intersections between uh, what is medicine in its absolutely specific sense and the the culture that is woven around medicine which of course again is uh, very specific to specific places like today uh, i'm i'm hoping we'll get to know something specific about south african practices as well uh, in in the context that that michaela will be talking about so with that as a note let me hand it over to swati who has been uh, diligent with organizing this seminar series alongside me and uh, swati will introduce michaela our speaker today and we'll go into michaela's uh, talk after that thank you so much for joining everyone and we'll have of course a question answer at the end where you're all welcome to participate thank you so much over to you swati hello everyone and welcome michaela and welcome everyone michaela is michaela clark is a phd she candidates at the center for the history of science technology and medicine university of manchester her training in visual culture studies uh, in south africa where she has lectured and supervised both undergraduate and postgraduate students her ongoing doctoral project focuses on a 20th century collection of clinical surgery photographs held at the university of cape town's pathology learning center michaela we're really glad to have you most welcome here over to you now Thanks so much, Swati, and thank you, Arka. Um, yeah, thank you so much for hosting me and my talk as part of your excellent uh, colloquy series. Um, I'm I'm really excited to be here and to share a bit of my research. As I think most PhD students, um, we become so engrossed in our research, but we have no one to talk to about it half the time. Uh, so this is a really exciting opportunity for me, and I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about clinical photography today, specifically as this relates to the uh Cape Town uh context so Cape Town is a city in South Africa um and I am going to be kind of looking more broadly at um theories related to the clinical the colonial the clinical and the colonial gaze um but also trying to kind of navigate these um kind of social theories and and historical kind of uh, sense makings of the medium of photography in relation to a particular case study that both embraces and troubles some of these ideas so um yeah let's let's go on this journey together um one one thing i am going to share some photographs um some of them are in the public domain some of them are not i ask that you please don't take any screenshots or um or photographs with your phone or share them or distribute them uh there will i believe be a recording of this available later and and you're welcome to distribute that but just while we're going through the presentation if you can just avoid doing that um also because of the nature of the material some of it is quite graphic i am dealing with clinical material there are moments of nudity there are moments of um quite conspicuous symptoms so please do keep that in mind if you um are sensitive to um that kind of content um okay so let me just quickly find my presentation there we go and let's do kill me. there we go all right so yeah just another just another reminder so um i'm going to be reading my presentation to try and stay in time um so i see if you don't mind just i don't know just like waving your arms frantically if i'm going over time that would be excellent um because i can see nicely on my screen all right so um again thank you so much for having me i'm michaela and really what this talk is is it's an attempt to grapple with the power relations at work in uh, clinical photography as it was practiced in the city i mentioned cape town uh during the 20th century 
And um, I mean, I'm coming to this project from the point of view of visual culture studies, which is my, my undergraduate and some of my postgraduate training, um, as well as my doctoral research in the history of medicine, as Swati um, outlined a little bit earlier. Um, while the former sees my relation, uh, or my reading rather, of this clinical material informed by photography theory, the latter discipline, so history of medicine, has served to help me frame photography as a technology, while also unpacking discourses surrounding disease. Um, my ongoing doctoral research project uh, is basically me trying to bring to bear these methods and philosophies in the context of this home context, uh, sorry, the context of my home country, um, and specifically the kind of social, political and institutional climate of the 20th century, uh, especially as this relates to hospital medicine. Um, and just a little bit of, let's see, what's the, what's the first slide, right? So, so the, the first, um, just for a little bit of context, um, this is the collection I'm working with. Um, it was produced in this, not only the city, but the country's very first medical school. Um, and unlike uh, many other um, contexts, uh, or colonial contexts, uh, Cape Town was actually really late. South Africa was really late in creating or in having its own medical school. Um, so, which I can go into a little bit in the q and if you'd like, but it's not really the focus of this talk. Um, so what I'd like to do in looking at this material, it was material that was orphaned. I had to organize it, arrange it, and catalog it. It's over 5,000 photographic cards. So it was a lot of work kind of sifting through this material. And essentially, while it had been produced for most of the 20th century, by the 1980s, it had fallen out of use and it kind of had been left dormant until about 2014, when the Pathology Learning Center that I'm doing my research through uh, at the University of Cape Town um, when they kind of rediscovered it and, and said, we need to do something with this stuff. So basically, um, let's see. <laughs> Where was I? Uh, so, I mean, we had medical education that did not include photography um, in the late 19th century already. Um, what was being taught was uh, the preclinical uh, sciences of anatomy, physiology, biology, chemistry. It was only in 1920 that there was the establishment of a department of surgery, obstetrics and gynecology, as well as medicine. And that is, as a result, the moment in which clinical education actually began in Cape Town and in South Africa as a whole. So the photographs I'm studying were produced in this context specifically for surgical education. From 1920, they were made and used as diagnostic teaching aids to help students identify diseases that could be treated through surgical intervention in particular. The term clinical photography thus describes photographs that mimic the clinical encounter when doctors ex experience patients in the ward round, in the hospital bed, or in the consultation room. So these are not images of uh, microscopic slides or of specimens or of x-rays, although you'll see there are some in the collection not my focus uh, today. Um, instead, they are fundamentally photographs of patients. And when basically when thinking about um, material of this kind, a really important consideration is that, especially in the clinical context, but also in the colonial context, is that of the gaze. Now, the clinical gaze has been widely theorized, um, both in the sociology and history of medicine. Uh, so apologies for those who are very familiar with this concept. I'm just, for those who maybe aren't, I'm just gonna outline it very briefly. Um, basically what the clinical gaze is, is it's a form of perception that Michel Foucault identifies to operate within the medical field. It's essentially a way of seeing that allows for a detached mode of observation. It is um, donning the clinical gaze essentially allows the person who looks at the human body to see the individual person as an object to be studied. Really, it's about foregoing any emotional attachment that is irrelevant to the clinical context. In essence, the clinical gaze objectifies. As Mike Sapple argues, uh, the clinical gaze is a fundamental part of medical practice. The medical practitioner needs to don some form of detachment when, for instance, performing a surgical procedure. Even today, it's generally considered bad practice to treat friends or family um, as the personal emotional attachment might negatively influence what should be clinical decisions. But within the medical setting, 
um, the clinical gaze doesn't only forge this detached reading of the body, it also operates to produce a hierarchy of vision. So who is looked at versus who does the looking. Within the clinical setting, it is doctors who get to look at patient bodies, you get they get to read charts, they get to administer drugs in comparison to the patient who functions as a passive recipient of these events, who is looked at, who has tests done on them and who can't necessarily decipher or even see information about themselves. In other words, this hierarchy of seeing determines who is looking and who is looked at. The space of the hospital and the patient's case file containing personal information and test results, this functions arguably as a technology of surveillance. The camera seat similarly operates in this way. Like the test result of the chart, clinical photographs offer fixed and stable document or record of the patient's condition. In this particular case, the external appearance often used for diagnosis, but it's also see like for instance, disease progression. So photographs taken before or after treatment. And of course, as in the context of the collection I'm looking at, it can be used for medical education. To think about this hierarchy of vision, we have to attend to the broader institutional power relations that are at work. So John Tark has famously outlined this in the textbook, The Burden of Representation, which I have a picture for you up here on the screen. Um, and in which, in this text, he discusses photography as it's harnessed by state institutions, specifically in the 19th century. So for instance, places like the prison, the asylum, the hospital, and even the school. His argument is that it is not photography itself, but rather the discourses and power dynamics that operate through photography that need attention. The medium is merely that, a vehicle through which power operates. When used within the penal environment or corrective institutions, photography operates as a technology of the state in that it not only objectifies, but fundamentally others those it depicts. This can be seen quite overtly in the use of the camera in the 19th century, when photographs are identify, uh, to identify uh, individual, oh, sorry. <laughs> when uh, photographs are essentially wielded against those depicted. So in the prison, for instance, photography serves to not only identify individual criminals through the mugshot that I think we're all quite familiar with, but it also, at least again, in the human sciences of the 19th century and also into the 20th century, it served to, for instance, locate criminality in very particular facial or bodily characteristics. The characteristic features of madness were similarly fixed in photographs and used to aid in classifying people along lines of difference that weren't formed by social norms. So for instance, the mad woman or the hysteric was based on gendered assumptions about normal and abnormal sexual or social behavior. So photography did not only serve to objectify and quantify the individual in the 19th century, it also served a broader social purpose. It is for this reason that someone like Alan Sekula, who's written an excellent essay called The Body and the Archive, um, speaks of the camera's repressive potential. It functions to not only identify individual, but social deviance. Even outside the institutional setting, photography has been framed as inherently violent in this way. Susan Zontak um, quite famously compared the camera with the gun. So as you would similarly point and shoot a weapon, you would also wield the camera. For Zontak, a photograph essentially allows those in possession of that image to see those depicted as they can never see themselves. The photograph offers a form of symbolic possession over those depicted. Indeed, um, I feel this is quite a relatable experience in thinking about having one's own photograph taken. So often I wish to kind of look at a photograph before I allow someone to share it on Facebook or on social media. I want to know what I look like before they wield that power over me through my image. So that question of approving who gets to look who gets the last say in photography is something that when it comes to, for instance, uh, images produced within institutions like the prison, the asylum or the hospital, those depicted don't necessarily have the last say. When it comes to photographs of vulnerable individuals such as victims of warfare, famine, extreme poverty, they also arguably thus become victims of the camera as well as victims of their circumstance. The camera steals the image and circulates it beyond their own wants and needs. We can see then in overt examples of this kind that who does and who does not have the power to look and who is depicted versus who depicts matters. So within the colonial context, Questions of vulnerability, exploitation, and othering are particularly pressing. 
Indeed, the use of photography in the field of anthropology is notorious in its function to aid categorizing people along strict racial and ethnic lines based on physical markers as well as cultural practices. And rather than simply saying there's human variation, photographs served as evidence of not only difference but inferiority. So again, it was playing into the broader discourses of the time, both scientific and social. Again, the camera was thus used as a tool to reinforce existing inequalities. With regards to medicine in the colonial context, Nancy Stefan, whose book um, I've put up on the screen for you, has made the convincing argument about how the camera serves to conflate racial difference with broader concerns about, quote unquote, the tropics, as fundamentally pathological, um, and essentially what Stefan's argument is, at least in relation to photography, is that the supposed dangers of the tropics, so its climate, its animals, its people, and even the tropical diseases, um, are conflated in photographs of tropical medicine. In these images, race, place, and pathology are merged as fundamentally other to those of Europe and North America's temperate zones. But where does this leave us when it comes to looking at a particular case study? So this is the kind of broad sociological and historiographical sketch, but where does it leave us when looking at, for instance, my particular case study, which is taking place um, in Cape Town, and that focuses to a large degree around an urban hosp hospital, namely Grote Skier Hospital, which you might know uh, from being the first place to have the full heart transplant, Christian Barnard. Yes, that is, that is, that is its claim to fame. Um, Anyway, so with um, when, okay, so so basically in my research, I look at various hospitals, but for this talk, I'm gonna focus on Grote Skier um, because it was the place where most of these images were produced, um, especially after 1938, when the, the hospital was built and opened. Um, so, dum dum dum. So one of the ways in which it's evident that these photographs are produced here is both through annotations on the back of the images. Um, so there'll be kind of um, references to the wards in Khrutsky Hospital, but also in the photographs themselves, quite often you see ward numbers, you even see the logo of Khrutsky Hospital on, for instance, patient clothing, or even sometimes on furniture. My research is thus, is, um, focused on taking stock of the power relations within this particular institution because they would have obviously channeled into the photographs produced within its walls. Um, and what I'm trying to kind of make sense of is the geographical, political, as well as institutional backdrop that would have motivated and informed the production of this material. So uh, one key aspect um, that I've discovered in terms of existing literature and that I've tried to outline is that a lot of discussions relate to specifically tropical medicine and tropical disease when it comes to the history of medicine and also photographic representation within the colonial context. Cape Town, however, proves a little bit tricky in this regard because it was historically framed as a temperate, not a tropical region. So climatically, it is technically mild, almost Mediterranean. This is how it's kind of historically described. Um, and the result is that historians such as Harriet Deacon have identified that for a large part of the 19th century, the Cape, the broader kind of Cape area in which Cape Town is situated, was considered like a home away from home for British travelers, rather than an exotic or dangerous or pathological terrain, it was often defined as a healthy space, a place of safe escape from the metropole and from Britain. Um, so again, what is important about this collection is not only that kind of logic in the tropical versus temperate medical uh, medicine debate, um, but also the particular town and its particular um, kind of uh, patient population and its function within the broader context of South Africa. So when we look specifically at Khrushchev Hospital, um, we're looking at a, at a hospital that catered to the city's entire patient population, its entire urban population. And like other parts of South Africa, where there would be separate buildings for white patients and patients of colors. So you'd have the hospital and then you'd have the native hospital, um, which is also quite common in other colonial contexts. In Cape Town, Khrushchev Hospital housed all its patients under the same roof. Um, this is, oh, sorry, that's my this is Cape Town, this is temperate a slide that I missed, apologies for that. Um, so this is a map of Khrushchev Hospital, um, as it was designed in 19... 
in 34. So this is four years before the, the building actually opened. Um, what is significant about this is that while Cape Town's patient population was housed in the same under the same roof is that it was a fundamentally segregated space. So the hospital was built as what Howard Phillips has called a mirror image in that you'd have the European so-called European wards on the one side of the hospital and the so-called non-European wards on the other side of the hospital. Um, the segregation went further than that, however. Um, indeed race played a fundamental role in the general organization and functioning of the hospital. A patient's race or the racial, racial category that was assigned to them uh, at this time was always featured on hospital paperwork, including patient files. These files were also color coded according to um, whether they were part, uh, belonged to a non-European or European, again, to use the, the language of the time. Um, but even crockery and blankets were color coded in terms of which patients were to use um, which material culture within the space of the hospital. So what's interesting as well and what is particularly troubling about this this institution is that it's not just the kind of material culture or the physical space that was segregated but there was also a policing of the clinical gaze within the space along specifically along racial lines um, for instance until the 1960s doctors and nurses um, in other words those with medical authority were all white um, while the medical school and this particular hospital did allow uh, students of color from the 40s, 1940s onwards, uh, these students were not allowed to see white patients in the European wards. Uh, indeed, the students weren't even allowed to look at a white patient. So if they were rolled into a lecture theater, uh, the students of color were literally asked to stand up and leave the lecture theater. It got it actually went to that extent that if um, a white corpse was being dissected, that students of color were not allowed to see any of the body parts until the organs were removed. So not even the dead white body was allowed to be seen by uh, students of color. Um, the irony of the situation is that because of this differential um, navigation of the clinical gaze, white students were able to look at all patients. Patients of color were only allowed to look at uh, uh, students of color were only allowed to look at patients of color. It meant that lecturers and staff members of the hospital valued patients of color more than white patients as clinical teaching material because all students could look at patients of color, whereas white patients could only be looked at by white practitioners. So, okay, so that, that is the kind of institutional, broad strokes in, institutional sketch. And then we have, of course, the question of the photographic collection and how do these discourses, how do these operations of uh, the clinical gaze within the space, which is clearly policed along racial lines, how is this potentially functioning or how is this being perpetuated within the photographs? So when looking at the collection, there are a couple of fundamental things that appear to emerge in terms of how clinical photography was practiced more broadly at Cape Town's medical school. For instance, in the early days of clinical education, so from 1920 onwards, right, that's when the first clinical uh, departments were set up. Um, we see very informal photographic practices emerge. These are, you can see them on the left-hand side of your screen here. So what we have is that patients are often in their own clothes. They're depicted outside. Um, there's very bright sunlight, which speaks to the technology of the time requiring a lot of light to, for these images to be processed. But there's also evidence that the photographs were produced with amateur technology. So box cameras and roll film rather than professional equipment. Um, what emerges after the establishment of Kuroshiki Hospital in 1938, so you see this happening in the 1940s, is that there's this greater emphasis on standardized practices in terms of photography. So those makeshift practices kind of disappear, and instead we have this uniform depiction of patients often in this kind of front and profile view that almost, again, is kind of reminiscent of the mugshot. But we also have decontextualized backgrounds that are often chosen to highlight particular clinical char characteristics. And we also often see patients in hospital issue clothing, so gowns and pajamas and so on. Essentially what we have in these later images with these standardizing practices is that context is stripped from them. 
you don't have the sense of space, you don't have the space, the sense of location, you don't even have the sense of time. And the fact that they are black and white images also renders them even more kind of timeless and universal. It decontextualizes them even further. So the patients float in this kind of ambiguous amoebic space. And they could have, and when I compare this material to photographs I've seen in um, hospitals in the North America and in Europe and in Britain, the photographic techniques and even the appearance of the images in general are quite similar. But this element of, let's say, universalism that seems to be emerging in these photographs of this kind of decontextualized ob objectivity does not only extend to time and space. Um, one fundamental feature that really surprised me while I was doing my research is that in over 5,000 cards, race is hardly ever mentioned. So while the back of the cards have various kind of details on them, the name of the patient, the date the photograph was taken, diagnosis, even age, race does not feature. It's not mentioned. Um, and this is particularly striking considering the fact that you had this, this, this material was produced in a hospital where segregation was such a fundamental part of its infrastructure, where race featured in every aspect of uh, the documentation, the case file, and even uh, hospital statistics. Um, in fact, the fact that these are black and white images um, also makes it quite tricky to even identify how race features in them. To categorize them along historical lines of racial categorization is fundamentally impossible, not only problematic, obviously, but also impossible. Um, I mean, and this was the, this material was taken in a time when, when South Africa was heading to and was um, also starting to implement a formalized apartheid. So when these racial categories were being drawn on a state and institutional level to a much harsher degree. And yet again, these photographs are not acknowledging race or racial difference in any overt sense, not even um, not even at the back of the cards. So Ultimately, what, what I'm trying to say with all of this is that within the material, race remains an elusive signifier. It is kind of there, but not there. It's present, but also um, it's also kind of veiled um, purely by, by um, its omission rather than by its presence. Now, um, this is not to say that, that um, this material is devoid, just want to double check that this is the right side. Yeah, um, I, this is not to say that these images are devoid of um, race-based hierarchies, obviously. I, I hope that that the way that I outlined questions about power relations, the gaze, and also the institutional context in which um, these photographs were produced demonstrates that there's a lot at play here in terms of um, inequality, discrepancy, and disenfranchisement. Um, however, um, 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 uh, However, when it when it comes to looking at the material, so I'm just going to go back quickly. When it comes to looking at this material, um, it is also evident that the assumption that there would be an overt kind of categorization or differentiation along lines of race that was my expectation. That these things are far more subtle um, than I would have expected. So. Indeed, race-based assumptions do emerge, um, not so much in the collection, but in the way that the photographs were used. So when they're published in articles and in textbooks, various racialized discourses about disease emerge and uh, broader debates about social diseases and risk factors, um, as well as questions of, of um, the prevalence of certain diseases within the hospital, they definitely do emerge. But the photographs themselves appear to kind of complicate the theories that I outlined before. Um, and basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use this collection as a testing ground for these theories to see how, again, how they do or they don't fall um, or how they do and don't resonate when doing kind of uh, thick descriptions or close readings of visual collections of this kind. So in order to make sense of this material more broadly and through, through other means, I have started to look at um, photography, not with respect to just the photographic output, so the final image itself, but what Ariela Azule has called the photographic encounter. 
Um, basically, this is this is used to challenge a kind of over, oversimplified reading of photography and also of medicine as unidirectional and as the gaze is functioning in only one way and is essentially creating docile passive bodies in the Foucauldian sense. Other theorists of photography who've engaged this, this approach have been um, Elizabeth Edwards, who's looked at uh, photographs, um, anthropological photographs, and also Gary Minkley, who in the South African context has look at, looked at past book photographs. Um, not much has been written about this in terms of the clinical encounter. So one of the ways that I've tried to make sense of this um, is by actually looking at how, um, and, and of course it makes sense that this hasn't really been looked into because what happens in the photographic studio wouldn't really be recorded, it wouldn't really end up in the archive, it would kind of go by and, and be um, excluded from the historical record. Um, so what I've tried to do is I've tried to look at 20th century photographic textbooks or medical photographic textbooks in which medical photographers themselves are offering advice and kind of identifying best practices for taking um, clinical photographs within the setting of the hospital. Now, from the 1950s, um, medical photography was becoming professionalized, mainly in North America and also in Britain. And a lot of these textbooks that were published actually ended up in Cape Town. Um, so the, the medical schools library has a couple of them. Our national library has some. Um, and actually going on uh, archive.org, I saw that the um, National Library of India also has a couple of copies of these, of these textbooks. Um, so a lot of these kind of international discourses about medical photography were clearly filtering into the colonial context. And so I feel kind of okay with, with looking at how these might resonate within the context of Cape Town's hospitals that was practicing biomedicine and that was also practicing photography in what appears to be quite an international manner. Um, so so one of the things that, that emerges when looking at the way in which medical photographers are speaking about patients and the act of taking photographs within the hospital studio is that there's this kind of very uncomfortable discussion of possibility for persuasion and even coercion when it comes to the relationship between the photographer and the patient. So one um, British medical photographer, Josephine Hunt, um, argues in her very small kind of textbook that, you know, sometimes patients think that you're taking an x-ray, that it's their insides that are being photographed, not their outsides. And her, her, her suggestion is, you know, if they misunderstand, that's okay. Let them misunderstand. Let's not correct them. Um, because it'll make the process of taking the photograph just that much easier. They might protest if they realize that they're having their outside photographed. Mm. So not, not great. Um, there are also other methods that she in particular um, kind of outlined. She, she speaks about how, for instance, she had one patient that was uh, difficult to photograph. And so she convinced her to sit for her after sharing a cigarette and I think having a cup of coffee and having a, a bit of a chat. And then the patient was more compliant in terms of sitting down and having their photograph taken. So we have these kinds of strange interactions within the space of the hospital studio that speak to this kind of persuasive, sometimes even deceptive activity on behalf of the medical photographer. Um, another aspect that I think resonates with uh, someone like Zontag's argument about how these photographs uh, allow a kind of symbolic position is that all of the photographic textbooks pretty much say that you should never let the patient see their own image, that it should not be something that they get to look at. And again, this kind of reinstates that question of who gets to look, who is looked at, and thus that hierarchy of vision is again kind of coming to the fore and, and renders this material quite difficult and quite problematic. Um, at the same time, however, the textbooks also demonstrate that there's clearly negotiation happening within the space of the hospital studio. So medical photographers who are writing these textbooks are often giving recommendations on how they should make their patients feel comfortable, even go, and, and like I said, like the cigarette is one, one uh, way in which that is done. There's also, however, a concern for modesty and limiting the patient's exposure if it is unnecessary. If it is unnecessary. So changing rooms are said to be a must, and it is highly recommended that uh, medical photographers work really quickly so that their patients aren't in an uncomfortable or exposed position 
for too long. Well, these actions are likely motivated to ensure compliance because you know the photographer wants to get their job done. Um, there's also kind of a recognition that patients that a patient's discomfort is important to consider, even if it's not wholly kind of in the patient's best interest, then at least for just getting that job done. And there's a lot of comments about how patients would resist if they were uncomfortable and how, for instance, the clinical photographer would potentially need to call in the doctor to reaffirm the need for that photograph, right? Um, and so again, calling on the medical authority to reinstate that power dynamic of, of practitioner versus patient. So um, what this also says, however, is that patients did resist because this, this, um, these suggestions, these recommendations wouldn't be written down if patients were always compliant, if there were these docile passive entities within the hospital studio space. So while there are moments um, of manipulation, uh, persuasion, even coercion, there's also evidence of pushback and negotiation within the space of the photographic studio. So when looking at, um, I'm almost done, this is literally my last slide. Um, so, and this is the one where please don't take any photographs that we're hopefully going to just kind of censor a little bit. Um, this is just for research purposes. Um, but what I would like to kind of draw attention to when it comes to looking at Cape Town's collection is that there are also these kinds of breakages in the unilateral gaze. So we have, for instance, nurses, hospital porters, and even the medical photographer being photographed in these images. So a nurse goes from being a medical practitioner to being a patient. Um, but, but even, and this is one of my favorites, just the image, um, the second image from the left is actually um, the, the photographer, the medical photographer who was hired, who's taking a photograph of his own leg to show how a bruise um, a, a kind of translates from color to black and white. He's probably also using or testing out some of the different filters like infrared filters that were commonly used um, in 20th century medical photography. Um, so we have this kind of shifting of roles about who is looking and who is looked at. Um, we also have evidence of patient resistance. Uh, it was not common practice to, to hide a patient's identity in the hospital studio space. That was usually reserved for publication when a black bar would be put on or when eyes would in a very creepy way be kind of scratched out. But here we have in a couple of instances where it is very clear that the patient themselves requested or even demanded that their face be covered in the studio space. This is, again, I decipher this because it happens very rarely, I think in four or five instances out of 5,000 cards, but also there's no consistent way in which the patient's face is hidden. One photograph uses a piece of random photographic equipment, one uses a sheet, there's another one where a nurse's hand is coming in to cover the patient's face. So there are various moments in which there is clearly resistance happening and the photographer's forced to kind of take that resistance into account. And then we have a kind of strange conflation of genre. And you can see that in the image um, second from the right, where this is, these are three patients who are all part of the same family and they were photographed clinically. So largely naked in that kind of frontal and profile view. They were also x-rayed, an article was published about them, but they're also seen here posing almost like in a group photo with the doctor who studied them and who wrote those articles about them. And of course, here you can see that they're fully dressed and they're also fully aware of the camera and seeming, seeming to pose alongside uh, the, the medical practitioner. So again, just to kind of finish up, none of this is to suggest that uh, power is not at play, right? It, it obviously is. It cannot be, cannot separate out those institutional power relations from the practice of photography within this context. But what I'm trying to do is with a close visual reading of this material and by tracing the use and function thereof, I'm trying to juggle the kind of discursive construction of the camera, the clinic and the colony, while also tending to the nuances and particularities of this collection within this particular geopolitical space. So yeah, that, that's pretty much my presentation. Um, I hope I didn't speak too quickly. I hope that all made sense. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your attention and, and for listening. Um, yeah. <laughs> Michaela, that was great.
I have loads and loads of questions, but I would like to, you know, give the audience the chance first to ask, because I can go on with her anytime. <laughs> That's true, we really can. <laughs> All right, so while they are forming the questions in their head, I'd like to ask uh, one quick thing, um, especially your last slide. You know, it was very interesting to see how the patients uh, resisted back then to cover their faces. But now that I see, uh, you know, clinic, in the, especially, um, I don't know, let's say since 20 years that I see. So one of my friends was suffering from cancer, from blood cancer. And she insisted that, you know, while she was being treated, her photographs of the entire body should be clicked. So she clicked the photographs of each phase of the cancer that she went through. And fortunately, Dutch which has recovered. So, you know, right from the moment that cancer was detected, was diagnosed, till the moment that she recovered and got married, she actually got the entire you know, collection uh, of the photographs with her and every time she celebrates her birthday she insists that you know the day when she was declared as recovered should be celebrated as a birthday so she can she always shares the photographs of the two contrasts you know the day of diagnosis and the day she was cured uh, the day she was the, the you know there are photographs that could disturb anybody the loss of hair the face you know the body that becomes extremely lean to the point that she actually turns out to be a gorgeous woman. And uh, I think somehow clinical photography, that's what I could see from her narrative, has also given people agency, especially in the modern times, you know, to share their photographs uh, uh, of the entire journey, in fact. Uh, there are people who have shared the photographs of their womits. There are, the, there are people who have shared the photographs of their phlegm. So, uh, you know, it helps them keep a track of what color of phlegm they've had each time. Um, so I think somehow it, we see a shift in the tone of clinical photography um, as opposed to being strictly rigid professional in the past where, uh, you know, the, not just the body of the you know, colonial, uh, you know, not just the body of the people living in the colonies, but the body of any patient being colonized in that sense uh, by the person who was photographing it. But now what we see is that, you know, there's this agency, there's this demand rather, you know, I want to be photographed, I want to voice out. So clinical photography as a platform, as, as, as a lens from uh, being colonizer to being a lens that uh, sort of facilitates the dissemination of a journey, whether that journey leads to, you know, failure of recovery or, you know, the success of recovery, but they want their journeys to be told through camera. So I was just thinking about, uh, you know, the current challenges as well that you face as a clinical photographer in the present times. So, I mean, so yeah thank you I mean that just like launches my mind in so many directions so thank you so much for that wonderful comment and question I think that there's I think there's two kind of different avenues um that that what you just raised uh raises for me and the one one is that um, that idea of agency self-representation and the use of clinical content, not necessarily, I would argue it's not necessarily clinical photography. It's almost a self-portrait that then becomes clinical in subject matter, right? So I'm thinking also about the, the work of Jo Spence uh, in her series Property of Jo Spence, where basically after becoming this object of medical scrutiny, it's about reclaiming agency through self-representation, right? And so you have this kind of, this dichotomy, and this is again why I think John, uh, John Tuck's argument is so good. It's not photography, it's the discourses that fuel photography that we need to unpack. Photography is a mean medium is not ev inherently evil, victimizing, objectifying. It is the purposes to which it's put. It's who wields it. It's how it's wielded. It's, it's all of these things kind of come together. It's the discourses that really need to be un un um, 
yeah, deciphered. And so definitely, I mean, photography, I think, has created an amazing um, way for individuals to feel like they can reclaim their body, especially after it's been kind of absorbed by illness, after it's been absorbed by the kind of medical machine. Um, and there's also something really interesting about this in terms of ownership and property and custody, because when you take a photograph of yourself, as the person taking the photograph, that copyright belongs to you. Someone else takes that photograph, it might be your body on display, but that photograph is not yours, right? It does not belong to you. And this is one really interesting thing that happened to um, a friend of mine who had um, a just, yeah, trigger warning, I'm gonna speak about a surgical procedure. Um, so, so just if, if that's a bit sensitive, please, I'm just gonna speak about this very broadly. Um, but she had um, benign growths removed from her breasts and she asked for, or no, she didn't ask. The surgeon, I think she had to sign off on photographs to be taken of her during the procedure. And she wanted this because she was interested in photographic representation and the object, right? So, so, so Kriseva's notion of the object, the object body, and because she was having a surgical procedure done on her breast, which is a fundamentally kind of maternal, you know, if we think about Kriseva's abject, it's connected to maternity and so on. And so she wanted to write about these photographs that were of her body, of a procedure being done to her. And the fight that she had to put up to lay claim to those photographs of her body, because from the hospital's point of view, they didn't belong to her. They belonged to the hospital. And it's the same with when you have um, an organ removed, if you have a transplant, any of that, nothing that is removed from your body belongs to you anymore within that context. You basically sign over rights to it to the medical institution. And so, you know, so the, so photography within that context also, th that question of whose is it, who does it belong to, who has rights to it, also become really complicated right now. And that's why the first thing that you will see when it comes to autonomy or privacy is that like legal, legally binding document is there. No patient can claim the rights to that image. No patient can like say, but this is an image of me. It should belong to me. Once you've signed over consent, you are, there's no liability. It does not question um, concepts of ownership, agency, possession, does not put any of those in perspective. So that was the one thing. And so if there's no other questions, I'm just gonna like rattle on of the next one if you don't mind. Um, so the other one, which I think again, is really interesting and really difficult to decipher within the clinical context, is what do we do with historical material, right? So we can say today, um, oh, I have agency to say yes or no. We have informed consent practices. I can take a photograph of myself as an artwork or as a form of, of, of diary or, or self-recording. Um, and thus you can kind of consult that living person on their preferences on what needs to happen to those images, etc. Often because we live in such a digital culture, the stuff just ends up online. So the assumption is it's okay, it can be distributed. With historical material, this is much more difficult because we can't look back and assume consent we, because the practices of informed consent were only formally implemented in the 60s and the 70s. So anything produced uh, before that time, you don't know. And of course, within, um, within the institutional context where you have power dynamics at play, it makes it even more difficult to kind of say, oh, but it looks like the person is consenting because there are those structural inequalities that are also informing who is able to speak, who's able to resist, and who's able to actually consent um, as we would frame it today. Well, it has been happening a lot, at least when it comes to colonial images and colonial photographs, is that a lot of individuals who identify with uh, colonized peoples, who identify and who identify, who identify um, some kind of ancestral linkage is that these photographs are actually being appropriated and reused not to demonstrate vulnerability, not to demonstrate um, passivity or docility, but instead they become either personal artifacts. For instance, in the uh, context of Australia, a lot of photographs have been almost repatriated. Um, so for instance, the... Um, Oh, my brain, it's not remembering that particular 
museum. I'll, I'll, when I remember it, I'll, I'll send it to you. But um, there's been this act of like visual, um, visual uh, redress in that photographs have been sent back, or at least large high quality copies have been sent back to source communities. And people have actually identified oh yes, this is this person, this was related to that person, etc. And that there's this often this quite intimate attachment to these images, even though they were taken as a kind of, and that the camera was wielded as a weapon in the instance the photograph was taken. The photograph today serves a different purpose, right? So there's also this question of not only the photographic encounter in terms of making the taking the photograph, but also what does it mean to look at the photograph today versus look at it when it was made and in the context it was made for. So this appropriation of material, uh, someone like Jane Lydon has written a lot about this in a really, really beautiful way. Um, there's also been um, a lot of, yeah, so, so, so that would be also one way where it becomes really tricky because especially with clinical material, you don't necessarily have a source community to go to. Um, there's no clear individuals or groups to address to say, what would you like to have done with this stuff? Um, and so while some colonial photography, there have been these kinds of um, attempts to return material or to grant some sort of agency to source communities, um, this is more difficult within the clinical context. Okay, so I've talked a lot now. <laughs> I have a very quick uh, comment and a question maybe. That was wonderful, Michaela, and great material and some really fascinating uh, sort of observations about the representational practices there. So, I mean, this, this is perhaps something that you've already implied in the presentation, but I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how the, the, the material that we had there in the presentation uh, perhaps talks against the institutional biopolitical framing of clinical photography in the domain that you're talking about in the specific hospital. I was just wondering whether some of those points you made, especially about the sort of subtlety almost by omission of the category of race, even though there's uh, clearly a very strong racialization, segregation happening there. Uh, I was just wondering whether the, there, is, there is any way in which even uh, clinical photography of this nature, which is entirely institutionally mandated possibly, whether we could you know, locate a point of resistance in the practice itself, or whether these photographs you know, talk back to the biopolitics that they are of course implicated in, uh, whether there is a talking back possible. I, I guess you already kind of implied that perhaps I, I couldn't, maybe I didn't get that right. Yeah, that's the question. No, thank, thanks, Alka. Um, yeah, it's it's tricky because I think, especially when you're coming from, the, there's a very there's a very easy trap to fall into in terms of reading into these images, right? So because especially there's a lot of the photographs because they're in black and white and because um, of the particular lighting, they have a very unique aesthetic quality, and sometimes they are if you kind of bypass the, the nudity or you bypass the, the conspicuous symptoms, there's something aesthetically quite beautiful about them. And that is quite jarring because these are clinical images, they're supposed to be objective, they're, we're, we're supposed to feel nothing when we look at them, right? And it's really interesting when I, as, a, as someone coming from a visual culture studies background, look at them and I see the kind of vis visual characteristics and I see the lighting and I see the quality of the film. And then I have um, my virologist um, colleague who's like, oh yes, this diagnosis is X, Y, and Z. And just like, whoop, like that clinical gaze, just like absolutely guillotining any of that. Um, and so I think it's, it, there are certain images that are really, really moving and really, really kind of touching. Um, in a way that kind of forces affect into the archive. Whereas like medical photography, but clinical photography is all about essentially removing that affective dimension, right? It's about reinstating that objectification. And yet 
there's something undeniably emotive about a lot of this material, whether it is um, a conspicuous condition that, that resonates with you in particular, um, or whether you see something that, for instance, you know someone in your family or within your circle saw, so the content itself, whether it is the look of one of the patients quite defiantly staring into the, the camera's lens, and that kind of moment in which um, I think I think Bart calls it the photographic look, that sense that you're being looked at in that moment by the person being depicted. Um, so there are various moments of rupture, definitely. The difficulty is that they are very idiosyncratic and it's hard to kind of compartmentalize oh, these are, these offer agency ways, these don't, or, you know, th this moment kind of talks against the grain ways, those don't. It's very, very tricky to do that. Um, instead, unfortunately, there are moments that kind of reinstate with the pile dynamics. So one of the things that is really, that troubles me tremendously is the fact that in those moments where, for instance, you can see, and I mentioned this in, the, in that last slide, where uh, patients are covering their face or clearly requesting their faces to be covered. Um, only white women who have their breasts exposed um, are given this opportunity. And so there's probably a lot of things coming together here. Most of those women are diagnosed with some kind of um, issues surrounding the breast, so some kind of breast cancer. And of course, there's the whole gendering of the breast. There's this question of how the breast signifies a particular kind of femininity, motherhood, and so on. They sometimes also older women, so that question of modesty and that question of safeguarding the elderly comes up, obviously. But then, of course, within the context, race is also the fact that that no women of color who similarly have issues with their breasts, who are so of a similar age, you know, the fact that not a single one of them has has been given that that uh, consideration or has been able to demand that consideration potentially is, you know, again, it's it's trying. So so there's. There's these moments where I'm like, oh, there's something there, and others where I'm like, no, this is just, this is just South Africa. No, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I was actually mm. thinking about that group photograph mm. and how there's a yes. sort of a subjectivization that happens as right. opposed to some of the fragmented yes. objectivizations yeah. in yes. the other pictures, yes, yes, yes. right? There's, and, there's also some quite interesting uh, photographs, like that because they are before and after photographs. Mm -hmm. There's this one very interesting example where literally it looks like a portrait image. It's just this young woman who had, um, uh, I think it was part of her stomach removed when she was 14. Oh, no, sorry, when she was 11 and she's now 16. And it's literally just a portrait of her completely fully clothed and it's just like an after image. There's nothing clinical about that material whatsoever. It's like, look, here's the organ. We removed it. Oh, and here's the healthy patient four years later. And so an image like that, for instance, would not be misplaced in a picture frame on someone's bedside as a kind of portrait of their family member. So there are also those very strange moments in which the, the question of is what actually qualifies as a clinical image, this is in a clinical collection, it's an after image, after surgical procedure, but is it clinical and what would make it clinical? So, yeah. Thank you so much. That's it from me. I'm sure others might have questions. Yeah. I have Arthur, a quick... go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. Arthur has raised his hand, so we can, yeah, yeah, sure. Hi, great, great talk. Thanks, Michaela. Um, I was, I suppose, I've got kind of two, two related kind of um, sort of uh, thoughts, I guess, in my head that uh, you, you take, take either of them and just run with them as, mm -hmm. as you wish. I, I'm working on a project on shame and medicine. Mm, mm, so I mm. suppose I'm kind of automatically kind of interested in what, um, whether when you are looking at people's faces, mm -hmm. there are micro movements, I mm. suppose, that would depict the affective state mm -hmm. 
that you are, as it were, reinscribing through this really valuable work in the archive. Mm -hmm. And um, with that view that for many people, the 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 even even in the 1920s maybe less so in the 1940s but still there would be a kind of formalization of when there's a when there's a facial image mm. there would be a formalization of the portrait mm. the people mm. themselves would feel almost um a kind of nostalgia for those previous kind of 19th century styles of portraiture, mm -hmm. which even though they wouldn't necessarily have it in their happy kind of happy um, pics, kind of flicks type of thing, would would come to the fore with the sense that having your medical photograph taken would be a, a kind of an occasion. Mm -hmm. I guess, so there's that, on the one hand, I was kind of wondering about, you know, shame or other kind of self-conscious emotions that seem to bubble up. Um, the other thought that I kind of wanted to ask was really more technical about um, whether these, how these would have been presented to students or how they would have been used um, before the archive fell into disuse, whether the, the photographs were paired in any way or there was evidence that they had been, because you said that you had to do a lot of the curating yourself, whether mm -hmm. some of those those things would have been paired with um, uh, genetic material or mm -hmm. um, uh, specimens, um, mm -hmm. how that linked in a kind of pathography, mm -hmm. uh, an articulation of pathography mm -hmm. and how that mm -hmm. kind of also impacts on the kind of, I guess, the cuts that you are making if we think mm. of the potential mm. cuts that that are made with the clinical gaze mm. they would have put the the image together with a sample but to reinstate the subjectivity mm -hmm. of the image you almost cut the sample from that to mm. re-engage the subjectivity of the of yep. the person so either of those sorry i kind of rambled on a bit but yeah no it, it's great like both are are great questions and thank you so much for asking them but just again mind mm. um so in terms of that i think the easier question to answer is the second one um so depending on time swati you can just like cut me off um but yes definitely so they were presented so they some of them there are actually quite a few versions of the same image and quite often you'll have the same patient almost presented as a case where you can see the clinical photograph and then there's a photograph of the specimen and sometimes in the pathology learning center, that specimen's actually still around. We've actually still got it. So we've got the physical specimen and its photograph. And then depending on the condition, there's also sometimes an x-ray. And in a very, very rare few cases, there are actually um, micro photographs. So when, for instance, um, something has like a specimen has been, a sample has been taken and, and analyzed. So definitely the kind of ordering of the material from what I could make sense of uh, while going through the stuff because it was in complete disarray um, was that these things were 100% paired in order to kind of present a clinical case. You could essentially see the patient from the outside almost moving in through the x-ray, through into the organ, even down to the cellular level. So definitely this kind of channeling of the clinical gaze in terms of how that material was presented. The, the photographs are all, um, they're printed and mounted on this cardboard. So it's for passing around. So it's clearly a kind of, um, it's clearly a teaching collection in that it was to be handled. And I believe from what I can tell in terms of both current um, pathology teaching in that museum space, and also some of the like scraps of paper I found in between that the duplicates are often because there were multiple tutorial groups and then the same group might be given the same set of photographs to work through. And so there's definitely a kind of tactile um, kind of use of the material. There's a touching, there's a, there's a turning around, there's a passing from hand to hand. Um, and there is definitely this kind of channeling of the gaze from outside of the patient body to the inside. So, again, seeing disease as the deep problem of disease 
as a surface level, right? So even bringing the organ as an image. So so definitely, and, and there was definitely connection to the physical specimens as well that are in the museum. And we've been able to pair some of the collections together um, or some of the photographs with, with, um, with the organs that actually relate. So there's a really interesting juxtaposition there. Um, in terms of, do I have time, Swati, to just like address the, the emotion and the show? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I hope that answers your second question, Arthur. Um, in terms of the first one, I mean, it's, it's tricky because some of these patients are very clearly in pain as well. Some of their conditions are quite painful. So facial expressions are often again it's micro it's the smallest of frowns it's the smallest of eye closures especially when multiple photographs have been taken of the same patient you can see those shifts more dramatically um and there's and then at the same time there's also other images where it's very obvious that the patients are performing for the camera so there's one series of images in particular that deal with a form of esophageal cancer that was linked to a particular kind of smoking and in some of those photographs, the photographers clearly asked the patient to hold the pipe and to pretend to be smoking it. The pipes are not lit, they're not stuffed. And there is a series of photographs in particular where there is definitely this performance of smoking. And one photograph in particular, um, where this man is kind of, the, the couple of photographs of him, and then the final one, he's kind of very theatrically, almost like, um, old Hollywood kind of standing with his pipe and kind of looking into the camera and like grinning with this big grin on his face. So there's definitely this kind of tension between uh, all of the patients seem to know what's happening. They, they, there's a recognition they stay into that camera or they stay just above it where the photographer is. But their experience in front of the camera seems very, very diverse. And some again some when i look at them i want to read resistance and kind of a bit of a like a if you kind of thing to to the cameraman or is that pain or is that the incredibly harsh studio lighting um you know it's very very difficult to kind of decipher but there are definitely moments in which that there's theatricality um in which there is discomfort in which there is potentially shame and i think that the, the photographs where there is that kind of self-censorship definitely kind of speaks to that question of shame and a recognition that others will see this image so there's also very much a self-awareness and an awareness of what this process means um and the very early photographs actually some of them have little vignettes so those little oval frames um so that those kind of styles of the 19th century are definitely gently overlapping. Um, when, when the practice is standardized in the 30s and 40s, though, that kind of thing vanishes. It becomes, yeah, it, it becomes very scientific. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a kind of interesting interplay of the vernacular and the scientific um, kind of coming into play there. I hope that kind of answers your questions, um, which were really cool. Are there any other questions? I just had one quick, uh, you know, thing that just leapt up to leapt to my mind right now. Um, I was thinking about mental asylums. Because I have seen a lot of photographs of Bethlehem and you know other psychiatric hospitals. I was just wondering about, I mean, you know this better than me, about the idea of consent when it comes to clinical mm. photography is a complicated and a much more um, convoluted issue, mm. to be very honest. I was mm. just thinking about uh, how or, I mean, of course, the, the hospital or the institute wherein they are housed does grant them permission to click the bodies of the mentally ill patients. But what about their consent? Mm. Has there been any work on that? So I know that in terms of asylum photographs, so it's interesting with asylum photographs because with the, the with, unlike with the hospital where, where patients were photographed pretty much only when 
a physician or surgeon decided that it was necessary for either the case file or often for publication. In the asylums, because there was this risk of the runaway, they were also used as a form of identification. So if someone left, um, there was this idea that we could track them down using the image. So again, that kind of like the, the penal, penal dimension of, of um, the camera. Um, I mean, within the asylum, photographs are also used for various means. They were also used to kind of prove, like prove improvement. Um, so the idea was that, you know, the initial image would demonstrate madness in some way and that when they were discharged the the kind of after image would show how much more docile how much calmer or how less um like for instance with religious mania um there are lots of images of, of individuals kind of in this praying stance how that would kind of subside um so photographs yeah so photographs from the asylum which i've not done i haven't done any primary research on but there's been there's been quite a lot done on this um do function both in the same way but also differently and i mean so who is it um cat rowling published an excellent excellent thesis on medical photography focusing a lot on asylum images um and and her phd is actually available online and she's actually busy working on a book from her phd so i will just quickly write i'll quickly type her it's cat rolling there we go um and she's lovely by the way just if anyone ever wants to do research on this contact her she's amazing um but yeah i mean she's mentioned how for instance there is when there's patient resistance it's actually written in the file that the patient resisted so the question is then like was it so rare and i think this is the question she poses was it so rare that there's only one or two instances where it's written down or was it really common and people didn't think to write it down, except in these random instances where they thought, oh, now, now it's worthwhile kind of saying something about it. Um, she also offers this one example where there is a woman who refuses to take off her veil. So she, I believe she's in mourning. She refuses to pull her veil up, not because of her identity potentially being revealed. This is also 19th century, not because of her identity being revealed, but because she was worried about what the camera would do to her. So she was wearing it almost as a kind of protective lens. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because we think about these institutions as total institutions in that they are completely like that they completely delegitimize individuality, that they strip individuals of any form of agency. Um, and yet we see in like any most historians of, of medicine or of the asylum when they start digging into the archives see resistance and see nuance i think within the photographs it's just such a visceral recognition of but there is pushback here so yeah i, I don't know if that doesn't probably doesn't really answer your question very well but i hope it gave it a does, something. <laughs> it does no, definitely i still have loads and loads but Let's not go into what I... I'll be seeing you soon, and then we yes, can have a long conversation that's, that's about I'm, it. I'm going to keeping those to myself, because I know I'm going to ask you those in person. Perfect. <laughs> so if there's no final question from the floor, maybe we could close the session here. Thank you so much, Michaela. This was wonderful. Wonderful to have clinical photography represented in the series and such interesting material that actually perhaps at least in my case, you know, made me more silent than you know, eloquent possibly. <laughs> because these are these are complicated images in more ways than one, of course. Yeah. 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 Thank um, you so much. Yeah. No, thank you, um, Arka and M. Swati. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you everyone who sat in on the talk today. I hope hope you were, if nothing else, um, somewhat uh, interested in the in the topic. Um, and that yeah, that it was worthwhile. <laughs> Thank you for spending the last hour and a bit with us. Thank you so much. Okay, Angel, I